thank you for coming, and thank you for competing in the fall intra-school competition for the Brendan Moore Trial Advocacy Center. Today we're going to be doing a training on direct examinations and cross-examinations. Um, one logistical thing real quick, you're going to receive an email. If you're signed up to compete, you're going to receive an email later today explaining that there are some clarifications to the problem. Most of them are minor. One is a little more substantial. We're adding a charge, murder two. Don't freak out, as Adam is going to explain today when he talks a little bit about case theory. It's not something you need to get hung up on, but it is something you need to be aware of and prepare in light of. So that said, I'm going to hand it over to Adam Schlotten. Adam is the Director of Trial Competitions here at Fordham. He's a former Moore. He's been leading our program for many years, fearlessly. And uh, he's also, uh, he also works at the, he's an Assistant U.S. Attorney here in New York. Uh, attorney General. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the Attorney General? Special Assistant Attorney General. That's my official title. Thank you, Prescott, for that wonderful <laughs> uh, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Schlahead. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is very exciting, uh, this new class of uh, potential Moors. Um, it's very exciting for me because you know I'm going to be working with you, and the, the new leaders of the, uh, of the organization are probably in this room. There's going to be people in this room who are going to get trophies and are going to have a wonderful time. It's going to be a great experience um, for you. So, as you know, uh, trial advocacy and trying a case is really an art and not a science. Okay? There's ways to do things and there's other, there's right ways to do things and there's other right ways to do things. And you're going to go to a courtroom and you're going to see many different lawyers doing the same thing many different ways. Um, but there are a few basic building blocks and a, and a few basic truisms that um, just allow you to present uh, your case and your story clearly. And that's what we're going to go through today, specifically in direct examination and cross-examination. Now, in openings and closings, you have an opportunity to tell your side of the story, right? In opening statement, you're going to be previewing your case, telling the jury what you anticipate the evidence is going to be, and why it's going to prove that your side should win. In closing argument, you're going to go over what the evidence showed, and now, I'm going to argue to you why that evidence necessarily means you have to win. In between, you're going to get out the evidence through uh, witnesses. Um, so you're not totally in control anymore, right? The evidence is going to come out through your witnesses, and you need to massage that evidence and massage that testimony so it tells your story as clearly as possible. All right, we have a lot to get through, so we're going to move quickly. Before you can start asking questions on direct examination or cross-examination, you need to have a clear case theory. What this means is, it is a sentence that you and your partner have thought about and considered and come up with, which encapsulates why your side should win. Okay? You must have this case theory before you do anything. Before you start thinking about what evidence is good, what evidence is bad, what, how you're going to ask questions, what you think of this witness, how you're going to close, you need to know what your side thinks. I'll give you an example. If there is a bar fight, right, the defense can't be, they have the wrong guy. I wasn't even there that night. But, if you don't believe that, it was in self-defense. Right? Those are two things that don't mesh, right? Because you either were there, or you weren't there. And you either was in self-defense, or it wasn't. So you can't argue those two things because logically they don't make sense, and the jury thinks you're full of it. Because you're willing, you're willing to argue anything just to get your client off, and that's not compelling, right? You need to commit to a theory. Either he wasn't there, and then he wasn't there. You don't care what happened. Or he was there, and it was in self-defense, and I'm never going to argue that my client wasn't there, right? <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. So that's why you need to have a case theory. You need to know where you're going. Um, so once you have this theory, you're going to keep it in mind throughout the, the writing of every examination, all your directs and your crosses. And then at the end of the, your preparation, you're going to go back and look at your directs and your crosses. And you're going to go through each question. Does that question support my theory? Does that make me win? 
And if it doesn't, then you're going to eliminate it. Okay? You do not have time to be going into subject matter which does not further your case theory. You don't have time in this particular exercise because you have a very short time period, right? You only have 45 minutes to put on your whole case. So you really need to make some hard decisions about what is the best evidence and what I'm going to spend time on. But that's also real life. A jury does not want to be listening to unnecessary information. They have this very short attention span, and they're taking time out of their lives to be here. And you do not want to waste that time. So it's very important that you treat the time as this sacred thing and only spend time on important information that furthers your case theory. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, not only do you have to have a theory of the case, right? But you have to have a theory of each witness. Before you begin writing a cross-examination or a direct examination, you and your partner need to think about, what do we think about this witness? Do I think this witness is a liar? Or do I think this witness just made a number of terrible mistakes? Or do I think this witness is um, probably, you know, on cross-examination, maybe they're, they're confused, but they're not a bad person. You know, so you need to make those decisions before you start asking questions because you need to be consistent as to how I feel about this witness and your tone and your question answering has to be consistent with those determinations. Okay, so how do you go about developing a case theory? This is kind of a basic model. You sit down with your partner and you go through, you think about, let's start here, with the prosecution. What are all the good facts for the prosecution? And you just list them, okay? Now, when you list them, I wrote good fact, page number, line number. It's very important that when you come up with a fact, you isolate where that fact came from and what that, how that fact is going to come out. Because if you can't find a page number and a line number, it's not going to come out during the trial, right? If your case, if one of your good facts in the case theory is that Lee Richardson is, uh, is a son of a bitch, show me, where is it going to come out that Lee Richardson's, Richardson's son of a bitch, right? That's not a fact. You need to get specific facts, and those have to come out through the testimony. Okay? It's very easy to kind of start making assumptions about what the witnesses say, but this, is, this will keep you disciplined, and you have to actually find where they say. So, you come up with a list of all the good facts, and then you're going to be exhausted, and then you come up with a list of all the bad facts, right? What really is detrimental to your case? What do you think the other side is going to really harp on? What do you think they're going to make a big deal out of? And you're just going to make a list, just brainstorm, right? Don't think about whether or not it's admissible or not admissible, just put it all down on paper. Then reflect upon it, right? Take a look at your list. What are the really important ones? Go through the good facts and pick your top three good facts. And then go to your list of your bad facts. And what are the worst ones? Circle those top three bad facts. And then, when you look at that, what you have circled, then you start thinking. And then you start talking. And then you can develop a case theory that reconciles those three really good facts with those three really bad facts. Okay? And that's your theory. It doesn't always go as smoothly as that, but yeah, that's what you're trying to do. Okay, so now you have a case theory. You and your partner are on the same page as what you believe happened in this trial and why your side should win. Now you're going to be now you're going to be writing your direct examination. Now Direct examination, the focus is on the witness. It's not on you, okay? This is somebody that you're vouching for, right? You have called this person to the stand because you feel that this individual has information that's going to prove your case, right? You think that they're important enough to take up time to call to that stand and talk. So the focus is on them, okay? And the, you need to, as I said before, have a theory of that witness, right? Is that someone, is that a smart individual to be respected? Or is this somebody who maybe needs kid gloves? Maybe you're, you're doing a direct examination of, a, of a kind of a, a grandmother who's not quite as quick as she used to be, and you're gonna have a different kind of tone, right? You're gonna have a, you're gonna, your questions may be a little bit simpler, and you're going to look at that witness in a different way, and you're modeling the reaction you want your jury to have, okay? Now, you know what your, your theory of the witness is. You know what, what um, facts you want to get out. Because you've already done good facts and bad facts. You know what needs to come out in this trial. 
So now you're going to start asking, uh, writing questions. And this is how you organize it, okay? First, you go back to those facts. What facts are going to come out during, with this witness? Okay, what do I need to come out during this witness? Before you start writing questions, what are the facts that I need to come out? And then you're going to see some patterns, right? There are going to be certain facts, like let's talk about the direct of the judge, Paul II, right? There's going to be certain questions that you need to come out about how he met the defendant. There's going to be certain questions that you need to come out about uh, their relationship, right? And about the money. There's going to be certain questions that you need to come out about what happened that day, right? But those are different topics, right? And you want to organize your direct examination into those topics. Call them chapters, call them chunks. I think in another law school I heard them called buckets, whatever. But you want to separate your questions into these chunks. And then you're going to decide, based on what it would be persuasive and what's the best story to tell, how you want to put those chunks in order. Okay? You want to uh, think about the principle and advocacy of primacy and recency. You want to kind of start off with a good point and you want to end off with a strong point because science shows that people retain the first couple things they hear and they retain the last couple things they hear and in the middle they often don't retain as well as the front and the back. So you want your front to be really strong and you want your back to be really strong. Now you have these chapters and you want to introduce those chapters with head notes. So what is a head note? A typical head note is like this. Now, Judge 2, I'd like to talk to you now about what happened on the morning of December 14th. Is that the date? 17th. Whatever it is. 13th? 17th. 17th. So, I'd like to talk to you now about what happened on the morning of December 14th. What's the first thing that happened? Okay, so what does that do? That tells your witness exactly what the next couple questions are going to be about. That tells the jury and the judge what the next couple questions are going to be about. So maybe they were daydreaming and they weren't really paying attention because they know they don't really need to pay attention until they get to the day of December 17th. Now they've heard that, and I'm going to perk up and I'm going to listen. Okay? It helps everyone understand what we're talking about now. So in front of each one of your chapters, you can put a head note. Now I'd like to ask you some questions about how you met Lee Richardson. Now I'd like to ask you some questions about... Um, the specifics as to the real estate deal that you and Lee Richardson entered into. Okay? What that does is it tells the witness exactly what you want out of them. There's no mystery. right? There's no hiding the ball. There's no guessing. <laughs> You're telling them what the kind of information you want, and then you can ask them, and then they know what to give you. It makes everything much, much easier and much, much clearer. Um, yeah. So, you're there asking questions, and don't worry about a transition from chapter to chapter, just use your head notes. Right? You don't need this like elegant segue, which brings me to my next point. Don't worry about it. Just say, okay, that's done, now I'm going to talk about this. Okay? Don't get hung up on those transitions. Um, avoid ads sounding like a lawyer. Right? You want simple, short questions. You don't want, when's the last time a friend of yours said, I exited the vehicle? No one exits a vehicle. Cops say that, and lawyers say that, and they think it makes them sound so official and cool, and I've been waiting my whole life to say exited a vehicle. Don't do that. It alienates the jury, right? Now you're like a lawyer instead of like a human being telling a story. Be a human being telling a story. What happened when you got out of the car? So, when you're writing your direct examination questions, you're like a journalist. You want to ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions begin with who, what, where, when, how, why, describe, explain, okay? What those questions do is clearly they're asking for information, right? You can't really give yes or no answers to any of those questions, right? That's why journalists ask those questions because it gets information from the person you want information from. You don't want to shut down the dialogue. You want them to say more and more and more. Who, what, where, when, how, why, describe, explain. If your direct examination question doesn't begin with one of those words. Think about it. why doesn't it begin with one of those words? And it should. Now there's going to become a time when maybe you need to ask if something specific happened, right? Because uh, it might be an operative fact. Like, uh, did you see a gun in his hand? Right? That's kind of important. He either did or she didn't see the gun in his hand. 
um, or Lee Richardson didn't see or found an event. In that case, you might want to, you might need to ask uh, a question that begins with did. Did this specific thing happen? Because that specific thing is important to your case, and there's really no way other way to get around it, and you want it to stand on its own. So you can ask a did question now and then for important facts that you need to isolate. But in general, you don't want to be asking did questions because that's kind of leading the witness and it's telling you're, and you're taking the center stage and you're kind of telling the story. You want to say who, what, where, when, how, why, to please describe. Can you explain what you made by that? Why did you do that? Okay, that allows the witness to continue speaking and tell their story in a compelling way. All right, so we've kind of gone over some of this already. But what do you do? You have to read these depositions or trial transcripts over and over again. Okay? It's a different kind of reading than reading a magazine article. Right? You're, you're, you're looking at each word really hard. What does that sentence mean? And you're going to read it, you're going to read it again. And what you're not going to do when you write your direct examination is kind of use the prior trial testimony as a script. Right? It shouldn't be like that. This is not how the direct exam your direct examination can necessarily go. These are just the facts you have to work with. And your decision as to where you go from question to question has to be a considerate one. Has to be something considered by you and your partner and has to have a purpose. And has to have a reason and has to further your case theory. Um, remove the clutter. If it doesn't go, doesn't push your case forward, get rid of it. You don't have time, get rid of it. Keep it simple, ask short, simple questions that anybody would understand. Uh, and organize those chapters in a compelling way that you feel is persuasive and that tells an interesting and compelling story. So, if the focus is on the witness during direct examination, where would you stand on direct examination? This is a little bit of choreography, right? The witness is sitting here, the jury, you want the jury to be looking at the witness, you don't want the jury to be looking at you. This is not your time to shine, right? You've opened, and you're a ham, and you're in cross-examination, and you're a ham. This is not the time to be a ham. This is time for you to kind of seep into the woodwork. Seep into the woodwork? That doesn't make sense. To, uh, yeah. So <laughs> if the witness is, is, is on the witness stand, and the jury is saying that during direct examination, you want to be somewhere back here, right? Or even back here. But the purpose is the witness is speaking across the jury to you, right? So they're facing the jury necessarily and hopefully engaging with the jury. Secondly, they're keeping their voice up, right? Because you're speaking loud enough for them to hear you and they're gonna speak loud enough for you to hear them. Um, and that's important. So you wanna stand kind of behind the jury so the witness is speaking across the jury. Now, granted, next weekend when you're doing this competition, you might be in like room 203, which isn't necessarily like a courtroom, but the important thing is you should ask the jurors presiding where the jury is, where you should, where can you consider the jury, even if the jury is a row of coat hangers, right? Because that separates someone who's just asking questions from someone who's trying a case, okay? Everything needs to be done with the jury in mind, where you're standing, not putting your back to the jury, right? Making sure the jury can see all the exhibits, making sure the jury can hear the testimony clearly, okay? Being conscious of the jury's experience separates a good trial lawyer from not so good. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Okay, so refreshing recollection. This is the procedure that we use when your witness forgets something that they once knew. Okay, it's not what you do if a juror, if a witness has never known something. Right? It's not like they don't remember a fact. They didn't remember a fact back then. They don't remember a fact now. They've never known it. That's not refreshing recollection because there's no recollection to refresh from, right? This is for when your witness is literally just nervous up there or they just space out and they forget on the stand. And maybe this may happen this weekend, right? Where your partner just, you know, they, they just forget a detail. You know, you, you have a short prep time, it happens. So that's what you use refreshing recollection for. And it's very simple, really. Uh, it's not something that you need to get bogged down with. All it means is that if you forget, and you uh, knew it at one point and said it at one point, or there's something out there that could trigger that memory, the witness, the, the attorney is going to show it to the witness, take it back, do you remember now, 
Yes? What was it? It's not so hard, okay? It's, um, it's not something to get bogged down in. Uh, you don't actually need to use the words refreshing recollection because, you know, if we're talking about lawyer speak, that's not really something that you talk about. Um, you say, do you remember? We're taking a look at something help you remember. So this is how the choreography of the thing actually happens. You're speaking to the witness, uh, you get to a fact that's important. That's key. It has to be important. If it's a fact that is in your question, but isn't really the most important part of that question, then go over it. Like, for example, when you're talking to the judge about the real estate deal, right? Maybe he forgets how much the closing cost on the house was. Or maybe he forgets how much the rent was on the house, but he remembers that we were clearing four grand a month, or, or a week, a month, right? Four grand a month. The important part of there is that they're clearing four grand a month, right? If it was 8,000 rent or 8,500, who cares? Just move on, okay? What's the important part? And you might not need to refresh recollection, okay? But let's say he doesn't remember that, or he doesn't remember something that's important. Then you need to uh, help him. So, he says, I don't remember. That's key. He's gotta say, I don't remember. And if he looks like he's floundering, or she's floundering, and just like, uh, you can say, do you remember? And they can say, no. Then you tell them, or ask them, would taking a look at X help you remember? Taking a look at your prior trial testimony, help you remember. Yes, yes it would, thank you very much. Then you take the trial testimony, you say, Your Honor, I'd like to have this prior trial testimony marked as uh, people's one, wherever you are, for identification purposes. You're not moving it into evidence. This is not going to be evidence. This is not going to go back to the jury. This is just, for this purpose, helping him remember. So I'd like to have this marked for identification. May I approach the witness? Yes, you approach the witness. Uh, there's two, I'm handing you your uh, prior testimony, you can take a look at that and look up when you're done, read from it silently. It's important that they read from it silently. They can't start reading from the document because it's not in evidence. Okay? It's just being used to kind of trigger their memory. So you can take a look at that, uh, read silently, and, uh, look, and look up when you're done. He looks at it, looks up when he's done. You take it back to your memory now? Yes. Then ask, what were you clearing every month? $4,000. Okay? So it's as simple as that why it's important that you go through these steps and why we're going over it is because it only goes quickly and smoothly if you understand what you're doing and you maybe you practice it once or twice, okay? Because you don't want to get stuck trying to get some guy to remember something that is not really your entire case and now all of a sudden you spent seven minutes trying to mark a document and refresh. You don't want to lose the momentum, right? You don't want to lose the point, okay? Um, <clears throat> We need another demonstration of refreshing recollection. We're going to move on. I think we can probably move on. Um, okay. So that's refreshing recollection, and here's the litany that you can use. Exhibits. Exhibits are uh, the tangible things that you want to move into evidence and use to help tell your story, right? They could be physical things like a gun or like a bag of uh, drugs or they could be fingerprints or they could be documents like a contract or a letter or um, a signed check or a receipt, right? These are things that you're moving into evidence and to help you tell the story. That's important. You have to know why you want it into evidence and you want to know how it's going to help you explain why you should win in your closing argument, all right? If you're just moving it in to move it in to evidence, don't, all right? In real life, that's certainly, you wouldn't do that. And in a trial competition, I don't want anyone to think that if I don't move in a piece of evidence, I'm not going to get a point for moving in evidence. That is never the case in any trial competition. You are being evaluated on, was that a persuasive, good, direct examination that forwarded their case theory? All right? You're never being scored on like a one for one thing. I ah, made a wrong objection, minus one, or he moved in a piece of evidence, minus two. If you move in, if you try to move in a piece of evidence that doesn't go very well, then maybe that wasn't the best direct examination. Maybe you weren't that 
uh, persuasively moving your case theory forward because you wasted time and you got distracted because you couldn't move these evidence. So that's why you want to do it correctly. Um, but don't think you need to do it just for the sake of doing it. So, how do you do it? First thing you do before you start talking about a document or a thing, you have to mark it for identification. And the reason you mark it for identification is so the stenographer, the court reporter, um, when they're writing the minutes of what's going on at this trial, it's clear what we're talking about. All right? If you mark something as Exhibit A, from here on out, it's Exhibit A. And there'll be no confusion if we're talking about this letter or that letter. Now, it doesn't seem like it's so important when you're dealing in a case of three or four exhibits, but there are cases with 300 exhibits, 3,000 exhibits. Okay? It is absolutely vital that you mark your exhibits and you, from that point forward, refer to them by their markings. So, <clears throat> moving in evidence, you, you say, Your Honor, I ask that this one page document be marked for identification purposes as Exhibit A. Okay? In real life, they would get a sticker, you would put that sticker on it, and you would say, okay, and then you'd move on. In this context, you just say, I'd like to have this marked as Exhibit A. We'll deem it constructively marked, so on. Then you're going to show what has been marked for identification as Exhibit A to opposing counsel. And you're going to say, may the record reflect, that I'm showing what has been marked as Exhibit A to opposing counsel. They look at it, and they'll nod to you knowingly. And then, because they have to know what you're talking about, right? They have to know what you're about to show the witness. If you don't, if you skip that step, they're going to say, objection, what is he talking about? Okay, so you don't skip that step. You show it to opposing counsel. You ask the judge, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? He says, yes, you may. He says, yes, you may. And you go to the witness, and you narrate what you're doing so the court reporter knows what's happening. I'm handing the witness um, what has been marked for identification as Exhibit A. Okay? Or I say, Mr. Jones, I'm handing you what has been marked as Exhibit A. And now you want to lay the foundation to get that in. Um, we're going to go over what that foundation is in a minute. You lay the proper foundation, you establish that it is what it is, and that it's relevant, and then you say, Your Honor, and now move what has been marked as Exhibit A for identification into evidence as Exhibit A. Or you can go shorter and say, Your Honor, I now offer Exhibit A into evidence. Okay. But you have to do that. If you don't offer it into evidence, you don't address the court directly and say, now I offer it into evidence, it has only been marked for identification and will never go back to the jury room, and the jury cannot see it or use it in their deliberations. Okay? It has to be officially moved into evidence after you lay the proper foundation. Okay, now we're going to talk about laying the proper foundation. Okay, so you're going to ask the witness, do you recognize this document or item? How do you recognize this document or item? Okay, that one people get hung up on. How do you recognize it? Uh, because um, it is, uh, because it is, but it, it's, how do you recognize that is, um, it's kind of a vestige from when, you know, a police officer is moving a, uh, a bag of cocaine into evidence, and he, when he sealed that bag, he initialed it, right, and dated it. So that's how he recognizes that that bag of coke is the bag of coke we're talking about, right? He'll say, how do you recognize that? Well, I recognize it because I, I initialed it, and that's my handwriting, and I dated it as to when I sealed that bag, okay? That's important because we know that he's talking about something he knows what he's talking about, okay? Um, that's why you need how do you recognize it before you start getting into what it is. So in this case, when you're talking about a document, or you're talking about a picture, or you're talking about a letter, how do you recognize this? The answer can be, because I've seen it before, or because I recognize it from its contents, um, or I've seen this before. I recognize it from its contents is very easy, because that, that, that gets you past a lot of things. But how do you recognize it? Uh, I recognize it from its contents, or I've seen this picture before. 
What is it? And then the witness will describe it. It's a photograph of a, uh, of a gun. Um, now, the next two questions are going to be different depending on what the thing is that you're moving into evidence. If it's a document, you're going to say, um, is this document in the same or substantially same condition as when you, and then the operative time and place, as when you first saw it, as when you received it, as when you sent it, right? This, this, so the important thing is, is it in the same or substantially same condition as in an operative time and place? If it's a thing, or if it's a um, picture, right? A photograph or a sketch, then it's not, is it in the same or substantially same condition, right? If it's a photograph, who cares if it's in the same or substantially same condition? What's important about that photograph is if it depicts what it's supposed to depict clearly and accurately, right? Is it an accurate depiction of what it's supposed to depict? So, when you're moving in a photograph, you know, yeah, the witness may have been the photographer, and oh, I, I took this photograph. Or the witness may not have been the photographer. It doesn't matter. Who took that picture is not what's important about that picture. What's important about that picture is if that picture is an accurate depiction of something that that witness has independent knowledge of, right? Is that an accurate depiction of the street corner as you found it on the evening of December 14th? And he doesn't need to have taken the picture. The picture could have been taken two weeks ago. But if it's an accurate depiction of how he found it on December 17th, then it is what it is. And then it's useful to the jury, right? That has to be an important thing to the jury. It has to be important and relevant to get a depiction of what it looked like on December 17th. So, um, yeah, that's why it has to be the specific and relevant time and place, right? You might have a picture of a corner and it's taken during the daylight. And maybe the crime took place at the night. At, at night. Um, doesn't mean that that picture can't come in if that picture is relevant for some other reason. Maybe that picture is relevant just to see the position between one house and another house so that you can't, there aren't any sight lines. Maybe that's important. So the time of day doesn't really matter, right? So the witness may say, yeah, it, it's, that's the corner and that's where the houses are, but when I was there, it was dark. That's still okay, right? Because it still is an accurate depiction of what you care about. Is it an accurate depiction of that street corner regardless of the lighting? Yes, it is. I now move this into evidence as exhibit A. Okay? Let's uh, do some examples from this case. I'm going to call upon my uh, lovely assistant, Jose Fernandez. <laughs> and we're going to move in a couple pieces of evidence. So, first, we're going to do uh, Exhibit F, right? Exhibit F is the gun on the passenger seat of the car. So it's technically Judge 2's gun, okay? You know what we're talking about? Now, first of all, you and your partner need to decide, why do I need to get this in? How does this prove my case? Okay. Now, this would prove your case for defense. It would help your case for a number of reasons, right? It shows that the gun is not underneath the seat, right? It shows that it's on top of the seat. It shows that it's a real gun and that it's scary. And it even shows it's catching the light a little bit, so it's a little bit shiny, and that helps when your witness says, I saw him with something shiny in his hand. Right? So this does help your case. So it's gone past that hurdle. It's worth it. Okay? But now, um, you need to decide, what is it going to, if it's going to establish those things, what kind of foundation do I need to establish? What kind of foundation do I need to lay to make all those things uh, relevant? So for this kind of gun, you need to establish that this is what it looked, this is where the gun was that day. 
right? And you're going to get this in through the, uh, the um, Chris Jensen, the ambulance guy. Because he's the one who testifies that, yeah, I saw that, and that's where the gun was when I got there. Okay? That's what's important. If this, if this was taken three weeks later, and someone just put the gun on a car seat, who cares? Right? It needs to come out that this witness says, that is how it looked that day when I got there in the judge's car. Okay? So, you get to the point of the story when it's relevant. Um, you know, did you look inside the car? Yes. Did you see anything? Yes, I saw a gun on the passenger seat. Now it's relevant, right? Now you've gotten to the point where you want to see. If you have a picture, you want to see that picture. So you ask the judge, uh, Your Honor, would like to have this uh, photograph marked as Exhibit F. Or, since this one already has this written here, Exhibit F, in many jurisdictions, they pre-mark exhibits. So, you, if it's already marked, then all you need to say is, Your Honor, referring to what has been pre-marked as Exhibit F. Let the record reflect I'm showing the opposing counsel what has been pre-marked as Exhibit F. They look at it, they nod. Okay. Your Honor may approach the witness. You may. Where do I have to reflect him showing uh, Mr. Jensen was in pre-marked as Exhibit F for identification? Uh, Mr. Jensen, do you uh, recognize that photograph? I do. Uh, how do you recognize it? By its contents. Okay. And what do you recognize it to be? It's a photograph of the gun that was found in Judge Tooth's car on his passenger seat. And when did you uh, get a chance to look inside the passenger seat? Um, right after I arrived at the scene. Now, is that picture uh, an accurate picture of how that gun was situated on that passenger seat that day when you first got there? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move what has been marked as Exhibit uh, F for identification into evidence as Exhibit F. Or, Your Honor, I now offer Exhibit F in evidence. And at that time, opposing counsel can object if they choose to, or not object if they choose to. And the judge may look to opposing counsel. Are there any objections? And if you don't have any objections, you can say, no, no objections. If you do have an objection, because maybe you think that this is misleading in some way, um, then you can object at that point. But you have to give them a chance to lay the proper foundation. Okay. So that was a picture of the gun. Now, so that was an accurate depiction of what it represented. You didn't take a picture, it doesn't matter. Now, let's do a document. And for the document, we're going to go to Exhibit A. What is Exhibit A? Exhibit A is the letter that the judge sent to Ms. Richardson, right? So you're in the direct examination of, this, of the judge. And what, what's relevant about this letter? Well, it kind of supports the judge's story, right? that he had told her or him to lay off, and it, 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 it corroborates his timeline, um, and it shows that there's this history of, of Richardson threatening the judge, and the judge trying to take steps to alleviate the situation. So if that's, if that's consistent with your case theory, and you think that this helps your case, then you're going to want to move it into evidence. You want the jury to see this, right? So you're doing, you're doing your direct to the judge, and you come along to the point in the timeline when um, he, uh, what did you do? And he says, well, I sent uh, Ms. Richardson a letter. Your Honor, I'd like to have this uh, one-page document, or referring the court to this one-page document that's been pre-marked as Exhibit A, okay? Do the record reflect I'm showing opposing counsel what has been pre-marked as Exhibit A? May I approach your honor? Yes, you may. Uh, may the record reflect the handing the witness was in three marked as Exhibit A. Uh, Judge Two, do you recognize that document? I do. And how do you recognize it? By its contents. And what do you recognize it to be? It's a letter that I sent to Lee Richardson on uh, November 15, 2010. And is that letter in the same or substantially the same condition as when you sent it? It is. 
this time, Your Honor, I'd like to have what has been pre-marked as Exhibit A for identification moved into evidence as Exhibit A. Or, Your Honor, I now offer Exhibit A. Okay? So we've established that it's in the same condition. It is what he remembers it was. Okay? That's the important part. It's not, is it an accurate depiction of the letter? It's, the letter is the letter. But is it in the same condition? Okay? And now, the letter's into evidence. And now, the, the jury can see the letter. And you can, once it's in evidence, you can do whatever you want with it. You can read from it. You can have the witness read from it. You can hand it to the jury. You could you get a, do a blow up and put it in front of the jury. Right? Once it's in evidence, you can use it. If you never move this document into evidence, you can't start reading from it. Right? If you don't move it into evidence, you can't have the witness read from it. Okay? This must be moved into evidence before the jury is allowed to know what's written on this document. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. <laughs> no, it wasn't necessary. <laughs> okay, so that is, um, now, I just talked about direct examination for about 45 minutes. It's ridiculous to think that you actually, that anybody can talk about direct examination and, and that you understand direct examination for 45 minutes. These are just kind of basic building points, okay? But, at Fordham, we really have adopted a learn by doing model, right? Uh, we very rarely do these kinds of lectures because, frankly, you don't really get it until you try it and you fail. And then you realize what you did wrong, and next time you don't fail. And next time you do it right, okay? So don't worry if it doesn't work out perfectly your first time through. If it doesn't work out perfectly, think about why it didn't work out perfectly, okay? And go back and you get better. Okay, now we're going to talk about cross-examination. Cross-examination is a different beast entirely. Um, whereas in direct examination, right, you seep into the woodwork. The focus is not on you, the focus is on the witness. During cross-examination, the focus is on you. The witness is no longer the star of the show. They got to be the star of the show during direct, and they got to tell their story. Now, you are the star of the show. You are the one telling your story and you're getting the witness to agree to it. Okay? That's how you have to think about cross-examination. You're telling the story. <clears throat> so how do you do that? With close-ended questions. What are close-ended questions? Close-ended questions uh, are short declarative statements that the witness either affirms or denies. Okay, I'll say it again. They're short declarative sentences that the witness either affirms or denies. It says yes or no. That's it. If your question on cross-examination is not a yes or no question, then you've asked the wrong question. Okay? Like direct, you want every question to be with who, what, where, when, how, why, describe, explain. On cross, you never want one of your questions to start with who, what, where, when, how, why, explain. If you're writing your cross and one of your questions starts with one of those words, then you have to fix that question. The point is, you control the narrative on cross. <clears throat> so a cross question is, you then went for the cell phone, right? You reached your hand in, Grab the cell phone with your hand, you pulled your hand out. You closed the door. You turned. Now you can add correct, or isn't that true, or yes, or is that what happened? But if you train your witness to be giving yes or no questions, eventually you don't even need to add those things, like isn't that correct or right. It won't be necessary. They'll just say yes, 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 or no. Um, you want to break down the action into very short pieces. But you only want to do that when, that, when those short pieces mean something, right? <clears throat> you, we tell the jury what is important to our case by how much time we spend on that thing, on that topic, okay? So you don't want to just ask a question, um, you know, if, you, if there are a lot of facts 
in that grabbing of the cell phone and the closing of the door and the turning around, if all those things are important, then you want to ask each one of those small facts. You want one fact per question. You don't want to ask the question, then you grabbed your cell phone, closed the door, turned around, and took a step towards um, Lee Richardson. You don't want to ask that question because what does a yes or no mean to that question? Sure. If he just says yes, then is he adopting every aspect? If he says no, which aspect, which fact in that question is he denying? Okay? You want one specific fact per question. If you have more than two facts, more than one fact in the question, break it up into two questions. Okay? <clears throat> be emotionally congruent across the be cross. What does that mean? That means like we're talking before, if you're cross-examining um, an elderly gentleman uh, who, you know, whose bike was stolen, you're not going to cross him like he's, um, if you don't, if you think he's just mistaken because he has bad eyesight and couldn't see who took it, right? You're going to cross him like that. And you don't have great eyesight. And, 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 and you, you wear glasses, and those glasses are this prescription, and you've been wearing glasses for 30 years. Um, And you're wearing those glasses that day, and the sun wasn't particularly bright that day, right? It was, it was, it was after dusk. So you're going to ask those questions in that way. You know, like, listen, it's okay. You, you couldn't see that right. You're not going to take that um, tone with a police officer that you believe and have decided is your theory that they planted evidence, right? You're going to be much more aggressive with that witness. And it's because you have disdain for that witness. That witness has done something terrible. They've planted evidence. They've perverted justice, right? And you can have that kind of indignation when you ask those questions. But you have to have a theory of the witness before you start um, crafting your cross-examination. Um, <clears throat> so there may be temptation to ask an open-ended question because you're thinking, there is no answer you could possibly give. I am so clever. I have thought about every possible answer you could give, and they all work for me. That may be true. Okay? But it's not going to be clean. And we're just starting out on this. And it is safer, and it is better, and it always works if you keep it to close-ended, short, declarative questions. Okay? In 12 years, if you're a master and you've won a dozen trials and you want to start asking open-ended questions, listen, people get away with it and people, and people are brilliant and, and they're masters. Um, we're not there yet, okay? You have to learn to walk before you can run. And cross-examination should be exclusively closed-ended questions. Just tell them. Don't ask them. Tell them and have them agree with uh, <clears throat> So, how do you start writing your cross? Very similar to direct. You're going to read the statement a number of times. You're going to determine, what do I need to get out of this witness? You're going to break those facts into chapters or chunks, right? You know, you're going to have a cross chapter on um, that, the, that the judge is going up for re-election, right, and that he needs money. And you're going to have a cross chapter that the judge wants to protect his reputation. And you're going to have a cross chapter on the fact that, um, you know, he didn't write this letter. You know, whatever it is. But those are different chapters, right? And you don't want them overlapping. So the same way you divide your chapters and by head notes and direct, you can do the same thing on cross, all right? This notion that you want to sneak attack and the witness won't know it's coming. It's nonsense, okay? You're getting out, your, your questions, they're going to answer your questions, not because you're tricking them. They're going to answer your questions because they have to. Because that's what their testimony has already said, right? They have to say yes to that because they said it before, okay? That's why they're going to answer your questions. It's not trickery. There's no hiding the ball, okay? So tell the witness. Now, judge, now I'd like to ask you some questions about what it takes to get elected as a judge, okay? 
And then ask questions about what it takes to get elected as a judge, right? Good reputation, uh, money, not being associated with people who are selling weed. You know, like all kinds of, these, these are facts that you're not going to ask this question unless you know what the witness is going to say or whether or not, or whether common sense just has to dictate that they have to answer yes or no. Okay. Um, you want to, again, begin with your best chapter or one of your best chapters and end with one of your best chapters. Right? You want to start strong and you want to end strong. Do not repeat what happened in direct examination. Okay? If it's out in direct examination and you don't have another spin to put on it, or you don't need that fact to, to, to tell your little story in an elegant way, there's no reason to be rehashing facts that have already come out in direct. Go straight to what's important to your case. Okay? Ask less questions. That's all right. A short cross is okay. All right? There's you don't need. It's not like you a withering cross that just goes on and on and on. You're not necessarily making points, okay? Make your points and then get out. And don't be repetitive. <clears throat> so, we talked about where you stand during direct examination. If the focus is no longer on the witness and the focus is on you, where would you stand during cross examination? So if this is the jury, that's the witness, you want to be right here, right? You want to be able to look at the jury. When you ask questions, you want to be able to look at the witness. You want to maintain eye contact on the witness so they know you're not screwing around. And then maybe you want to look at the jury when the witness says something that's really important. And you want to look at them and say, are you recognizing how important this is? Okay. So you want to be here so the jury can see you and so the witness can see you. And your proximity to the witness also is a way of kind of controlling that witness and letting them know that you Um, <clears throat> you want to use your body to actually segue from topic to topic. If you're doing a head note, if you've just talked to the judge about everything that it takes to become a judge, but now you want to talk about the, uh, uh, the day in question, December 14th. Use your body and actually walk with purpose. Instead of pacing the entire time, just pacing and pacing and pacing and pacing, which is distracting, you stand here, you ask your questions about your first topic, now, Your Honor, I'd like to talk to you about what happened on December 14th. And then plant again and ask your questions about what happened on December 14th. Okay? You're actually um, you're moving topics and you're physically moving. Um, and then you're planting. And then you're asking your questions. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Now, this notion that cross-examination is this adversarial thing, right? The witness is not going to want to give you what you want. So how do you control the witness so the witness answers the way you want them to answer and doesn't drone on and on and on and tell their story and get off topic when you're trying to tell your story and you want very specific facts and not other facts. So how do you control what the witness says? The first and most important thing is think about your question. Okay? Every time a witness starts running and giving you facts that you don't want to talk about and starts talking about what they want to talk about and gets off topic and is blathering on, 99% of the time the problem is with you because you've asked an imprecise question. Okay? The shorter, more precise your question on cross-examination is, if it can only possibly and reasonably be answered yes or no, more likely than not, you're going to get that yes or no. If you ask a question that has um, an ambiguity in it, that witness will take the opportunity to exploit that ambiguity. Um, and then you started running really fast, didn't you? Well, I don't know if it was really fast. I, was, I mean, I was running, I was certainly you know, going faster than a walk, but I, you lost, right? So because that word really, who knows what really means, all right? But if you ask, you were walking, and then you started running. Yes, there's no question. I was run, walking, and then I was running, okay? If you have these kinds of um, modifiers, like really, or very, or you did this because this, because is a big problem, right? 
You don't need the witness to answer, I did this because this. They're always going to, because allows them to wiggle. Well, I don't know, I did it only because of that, I did this, I mean, I did this, and then this, and I mean, I, 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 this also came into play. So don't say, you did this because that. Just say, that happened, then you did this. No because. Just put fact next to fact, and the jury will understand that there's a because there, even though you don't need to say it. Um, so if a witness is, is speaking and not answering the question that you ask, have you controlled them? You can use your hands. It's, I'm sorry. First of all, always blame yourself. Start off by blaming yourself, because this is, this is a contest of who's the more re reasonable person in the room. And you want the jury to think it's you, not the witness. I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. Let me ask that again. Or, I'm sorry, maybe my question wasn't precise. Let me ask it this way. Okay? And now, you're telling the room that you're trying, to be, you're trying to be cool here. You're trying to be reasonable. This witness is giving you a hard time because it's unreasonable for them to be giving you a hard time. So, blame yourself, re-ask them in a calm, controlled way. Okay? Then you've contrasted you're the good guy in this time. If it still doesn't work, um, do it again. All right? Or ask it a different way. Think about, was it my question that was wrong? And maybe make your question more precise. Okay? But that's how you control the witness, by the, the actual question. It's not some kind of mystical mind meld that, that Jedi mind. And what you don't want to do necessarily is ask the judge for help, okay? Now a judge, if it's clear that you're being reasonable and you're asking fair, short, precise questions, and the witness is just blathering on and on, the judge will often jump in. If you can answer with a yes or no, please answer with a yes or no, and they'll direct the witness to, you know, be reasonable. That's great. What you don't want to do is ask a question and the witness says, uh, Your Honor! Can you direct the witness to please answer the question as asked? Because you look like a loser. You look, you've lost control. <laughs> you look like you can't handle yourself. You're looking like you're asking the judge for assistance when you don't need assistance. You're in control. You know the facts better than anyone in that room. And that's the persona that you have in that courtroom. Right? Um, and you may hear differently. You may hear people say, you know, the witness is being so difficult. Ask the judge for assistance. If you can do it in a cool way, do it in a cool way. I'm just telling you, ideally, you want to be maintain control. Okay, impeachment. How do you impeach a witness? What is impeachment? Impeachment is when a witness has now said something on the stand, either in direct examination or in cross-examination, that is in direct contradiction to something they previously said. Okay, so now you have proof that they're a liar, and you want to use it. Okay, so when do you do this? First of all, you do it when they've said something today that is in direct contradiction to something they said before. All right, and it has to be in direct contradiction. Okay, it can't be just kind of different. It has to be totally inconsistent. And you have to decide whether what they said today is bad for you. Right? If they said something before, and then they said something today that actually helps your case, go with what they said today. Okay? You're not impeaching for the sake of impeaching. You're not impeaching just to show that this person says different things at different times. You're impeaching because what they said today hurts you. And they're lying because they don't want to admit what they said before because that helps you. Okay? And here's the final one. It has to matter. It has to be important. Uh, this professor out in Stetson, which is a powerhouse in trial advocacy, his phrase is don't pole vault over a cat turd. Okay? It's graphic. But what you, you don't want to necessarily do an impeachment if that fact isn't important to your case and if it doesn't further your case theory. Because it takes some time and you're making a big deal out of a fact and you're telling the jury this is a big deal because I've caught this person in a lie, and it better be a big deal or else it's going to feel like you're wasting people's time. So how do you actually do it? Okay, to impeach a witness, uh, it's R-A-C, okay? Recommit them to what they've said today. A 
credit what they said before, and then confront them with what they said before. Okay? Then recommitting, uh, you're locking them into what they've just said. Okay? So if the witness, um, if the issue is whether what, what color was the light in the intersection, right? And uh, at the scene of the, uh, of the accident, this guy said the light was red. And today, they said the light was green. Right? And the light being green devastates your case. Right? It's very important that the light be red. Okay? So it's important. Now you've made that determination. So you need to recommit them. On direct examination, I just want to be clear. On direct examination, you said that the light was green at the time of the accident? Yes. Okay, you've locked them in. Right? Now they're saying today that the light is green. Now you want to accredit their prior testimony. Accredit it means display and explain and show the jury why what they said before is more credible, why it has more truthiness, right? So what makes their prior statement more truthy is going to depend on what that prior statement is, right? Maybe for this um, example, for the, the light changing, maybe it's the time, right? So then. If the time is what makes it more fruitful, then you want to go into that. You want to ask, now you were uh, interviewed at the scene of the accident, correct? Yes. That was back on July 12, 2011? Yes. That's like two and a half, two, three, two years ago. <laughs> Over two years ago, right? Yes. And when you were interviewed, it was just moments after the accident happened, wasn't it? Yes. Okay? So now what we've done, that's accrediting the prior testimony. That's showing that what you said moments after the accident, two years ago, is probably right and more right than what you're saying two years later, right? So that's the accrediting. And then you confront them. Mr. Jones, uh, in that report, um, Officer Stevens asked you what color was the light at the time of the accident. And you told him the light was green. You were asked that question, and you gave that answer. Correct? And the witness will have to admit it. Yes. And then you're done. Okay? You do not ask another question about that issue. You may want to ask the question. So, what is it, Mr. Stevens? Were you lying then? Are you lying today? Because we don't know what to believe anymore. <laughs> don't do that. Right? You've given the witness an opportunity to fix it. Right? If you just impeached him with this clear inc inconsistency, and said the light was red today, at that time you said the light was red. Correct? Yes. Move on to your next chapter. Then on closing, you can do anything you want with it, right? You can say all those things. You can say, he got up on the stand and under oath told you that the light was red when two minutes after the accident he had to admit that the light was green because that's the truth. Right? You can do anything you want in closing argument. You can frame the issue. You can make the arguments that that person, because they changed their testimony, is not to be believed about any issue whatsoever. But you don't do that with the witness. Because what if you ask the question, so which is it? Blah, 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 blah. And then the witness can really explain. Well, that day I was on police officer was asking me these questions, and, and there was literally two police officers asking me questions at the same time, and I, and I got confused, and I thought they were talking about a different intersection, not this necessary intersection, and you know, I've thought about it a lot since then, and I've had an opportunity to review video, and, uh, and I've spoken to other people, and, and I'm, the light was red. I, I apologize for making a mistake earlier, the light was, it was always red, or whatever. So that takes the wind out of your sails a little bit, right? Now, they may do that on, on redirect, and they may try to rehabilitate the impeachment and let them, that's fine. But you've done an impeachment and on closing argument, you can make the arguments you want to make. Never allow the witness to explain, okay, on cross-examination. You control the story. And on cross, you're telling the story that you want to tell, and that's it. Okay? Um, so, let's give you an example. Oh, and here's another thing. Right? They said on direct examination, 
something that you are sitting there, you, you, it perks up in your ears. And uh, you're like, oh my god, that's totally not what they said in the deposition. I'm going to impeach them on the cross, and it's going to be awesome. And now I'm thinking about the impeachment, and it's going to be so good. And you start during the impeachment, and uh, you get up on cross. Now, on direct examination, you said the light was green, right? Now, you did a, 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 a report in this matter, and you were asked a series of questions, and then you go back to the prior testimony, and it's not quite there. Or maybe his quote is, well, it was green, or it might have been yellow, I'm not really sure, I wasn't looking. So now, you've set up this whole impeachment, and you don't have the goods. So to do an impeachment without embarrassing yourself and being in a terrible position, find it first. Okay? Before you begin the process of impeaching a witness with prior testimony, isolate the prior testimony. Make sure you have it. Make sure it's a direct contradiction. Okay? And then, once you know that you have it, then begin the process of the impeachment. Then recommit him. Because as soon as you recommit him to what he said today, the judge and the evaluator certainly will know what you're doing. Okay? So you don't want to waste that opportunity. Um, Okay. Oh, so let's um, let's do a quick impeachment. Mr. Fernandez, huh? we're running out of time. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do? We're gonna do a, a impeachment of Jesse Brown. With the, the Jesse Brown admits to recognizing the handwriting in Exhibit B, right? And. Uh, that's really good for us, good for the defense, that she recognizes as Paul II's handwriting, because Paul II uh, denies writing, right? So let's say on direct examination now, uh, you just heard the witness say, you know, I'm not sure um, whose handwriting it is, I can't say for certain. Okay? So that's what they said on direct. Now that is in direct contradiction. Because we've gone back to the to the testimony, we see on page 25, line 2, it says, I'm showing you exhibit B without worry, worrying about the content. Do you recognize this handwriting? The answer is unequivocally, yes, this is Judge 2's handwriting. Okay? So you found it. You've isolated the inconsistency, and now you're going to go through the AP. Okay? So um, this is what's his face? Jesse Brown on the sand. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Brown, on direct examination, you were asked a series of questions about Exhibit B, the handwritten note, correct? Yes. And you were asked about the handwriting uh, on Exhibit B, correct? Yes. And you stated on direct examination that I can't be certain whose handwriting that is. I'm just not sure. That was your answer, correct? Yes. See, I'm kind of referencing because I wrote it down. All right, it's very important to give them their exact words right back. Now, you took a deposition in this case, correct? And that deposition uh, was dated back on the 17th day of April, 2011. And you were asked a series of questions, and you gave a series of answers. And at that time, you were under oath, correct? You swore an oath to tell the truth. Yes. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. That's right. And there's a stenographer writing every word you said down, correct? I don't know. So, you've established that he was under oath. Like, that's what makes the deposition truthy, right? The fact that it's under oath. The fact that it was this formal proceeding and he was sworn. Um, so that's what makes this truthy. So that's why you credit with that. And then you simply ask, now, Mr. Brown, at that deposition on April 17th, you were asked the following question and you gave the following answer. Question, I'm showing you Exhibit B without worrying about the content Do you recognize this handwriting. Answer, yes, this is Judge Two's handwriting. When you ask that question, you give that answer. Yes. That's it. And then you move on. Okay. I would dissuade you from, I'm going to hand you a copy of your deposition, and I'd like you to read the first two lines, and I'm going to 
sit back here very smug and watch as it all unfolds in front of you. You've, you've abdicated control of the situation, right? You control the situation when you read from the deposition and you say how you want to say it. Because he's going to say, I'll show you his interview without one. And yeah, it doesn't have quite the same punch as when you can put framing and put into your words with your emphasis. Okay, so that's an impeachment. That's a direct impeachment. When they've said something that's specifically contrary to something they said today. What about impeachment by omission? This is more this is a little trickier, and it's especially tricky in real life. I promise you'll be very quick. Um, impeachment by omission is when they've said something today that they've never said before, and they should have said it before. That's the key. It can't just be something that they've never said before. It has to be the kind of fact that would have been in their prior testimony if it were true, or should have been in their prior testimony if it were true. Okay? So what you do in that case is you recommit them the same way you did. So just to be clear, on direct examination, you said the light was red? Correct? Yes. You gave uh, a statement to the police right after that, right? And, and there was a box to check, um, color of the light, right? And nowhere did you ever say that the color of the light was red. Isn't that true? That's true. Okay. So you've impeached him by saying what, the, what you said today has never been said before. In this context, right, you have these prior statements. And these prior statements, there's a stipulation, I believe, that says these are complete uh, and everything they remember about, all the material facts that they remember about the case, right? So that's what makes this more truthy. And that's why if they say something that they never said before, it should have been here on closing argument, you can argue that now they're making stuff up. So, um, for an impeachment by omission, okay, so Lee Richardson says uh, that, remember she's, talk, she's asked about calling for help? And she says, I didn't call 911, I called 411 uh, and asked for the non-emergency help number. And that's something you might want to make hay with on cross-examination. Let's say on direct examination, she all of a sudden says, for the very first time, um, well, no, I didn't call 911 because the 9 button on my old phone was, was broken. Okay, so you're, you're going to go back into the deposition and say, did she ever say anything about a broken 9 button? It's not there. She talks about that topic. It should have been in there. She was sworn under oath. She said she was going to say everything she was supposed to say, and she didn't say it. Now it's an impeachment by omission situation. Um, Mr. Richardson, you were asked on direct examination about uh, uh, you were calling the authorities on that day? Yes. And you said you called 411. That's right. And you said you did not call 911. Yes. And you said uh, that the 9 button on your phone was broken? Yes. Now, you took a deposition in this matter? Yeah. And that was back in 2011, correct? That's right. And you were asked a series of questions? Yes. You gave a series of answers. Yes. And you were sworn under oath, correct? Yes. You were sworn to uh, tell the truth, That's right. to be as honest as possible, yes. and to be as complete as possible, correct? Yes. Now, nowhere in your prior testimony do you ever say anything about a 9 button on your phone not working. Isn't that correct? That's correct. That's an impeachment by omission. Okay? And again, you just move on. Don't ask them why. Don't say something snarky like, oh, so it just came up today. Huh? Nothing. You just move on, you're done, and then you can frame the issue on closing argument. Okay. Objections. Professor Kanan is going to really uh, focus on objections on Thursday. Okay. This is just style um, points on objections. Don't object frivolously, right? You're not there, it's not a, a point by point match. You object because you care about that evidence and that evidence shouldn't be part of that file, okay? So don't object for the sake of objecting. Don't object just to show that you know the rules of evidence, okay? Object because you believe in your heart of hearts that this should not be admissible. Okay? And that will show the judge that you actually care. Um, and be cool about it. And again, the whole point is that this is a credibility contest. Who is the jury going to believe? So you have to be the cool one. You have to be the credible one. Don't be a jerk. Have fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.